Our speaker this hour is Ed Malott. Ed is a graduate of the West Virginia School of Preaching. His son Hunter is a graduate of the West Virginia School of Preaching, although in different years. We, uh, we, uh, Ed, is, Ed and his wife Kim have their son Hunter and their daughter Cameron, and they are a wonderful, wonderful family. Ed is very well studied. Ed is very well read. He, he loves books and he loves getting into books, and he's an excellent teacher of God's Word, both in the preaching setting and and the classroom setting at the local congregation, and then also in the classroom setting at the School of Preaching. He has been very versatile and taught very many different classes for us. You can see a list of the classes he's presently teaching in his uh, biographical sketch in the book. We value him highly and are thankful that he's speaking to us this hour. I'm not sure I deserve all that, but thank you, Andy, very much. I'm going to steal Andy's thunder a little bit. He mentioned at the end of Dan's lecture that there was brilliance and boldness to begin the lectureship, and I added the word baldness. We have brilliance, boldness, and baldness. And although Andy and myself and Dan and others here, let me, let me say a quick word of, of thanksgiving to uh, so many friends, family in Christ. We're family in Christ, amen? What a privilege it is to be with brothers and sisters, and I love you people, and you love me, and we love the truth, and our God, and to assemble together, not in an echo chamber, just saying we're with people that agree with us, and we can be bold here, but, but we are soldiers, as Dan spoke a moment ago, for our Lord, uh, that great captain of our salvation, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10. I'm thankful also that we have a room full of watchmen. Ezekiel, you remember in Ezekiel chapter 13. 33, Ezekiel was a watchman on a wall. Brethren, would you count me today as a watchman on the wall? Would you count me as a watchman? Can I count you as a watchman on the wall? Somebody to stand for the truth and to sound a warning. One of the warnings that we have to sound, and I'm, I, I don't hesitate to sound this warning. I, I don't want to sound super negative when I say this, but there is such a liberal movement sweeping the church in so many places. Uh, hermeneutics is being being rebranded as Church of Christ hermeneutics or the hermeneutics of Alexander Campbell. Two areas of battleground, two battleground areas are women's role in the church and in worship and also instrumental music. Those are two things. Those are two things that we see and we fight. Our lesson today will deal with one of those roles in worship. And we're going to take the passage in a moment ago that's been, uh, in, a, uh, in a moment that has been assigned. We're going, to, we're going to get to that. But let me mention a verse to you. You know about this verse. It's Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. There are some who would ask us to read the Bible through the lens of Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. You know the passage very well, but let me read it to you this morning. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so... The Galatians 3.28 lens. We're asked to read the Bible through the Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28 lens. There is neither male nor female. Our society echoes that. We see now in many places you go, there are bathrooms that are Galatians 3.28 bathrooms. Neither male nor female. Either one, just go ahead into that bathroom, that dressing room, that NCAA sports Team. There are some who claim to be non-binary. They're neither male nor female. Our society, which is led to a great degree by the politically liberal left, our media, our politicians, our institutions of higher learning are pushing this Galatians 3.28 lens and it's found its way in many places into the church, into worship, perhaps into pulpits, perhaps perhaps even into elderships at some point. What's interesting about that in our text where we're studying today in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul said this, I want men 
And he spoke there of men, and we're going to think about that in every place, to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. And then the next verse he says, likewise, I want women. And so Paul brought up a difference between men and women. Paul's the very writer of Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. And so the one who gave us that lens didn't indicate that. There is nothing in that passage that talks about gender roles in the home, in society, in church. Ethelgard Smith said this, he gave an, an analogy, a sports analogy, and he says, as individuals, we are all on God's team, equal in importance, equal in access to God, but being a team member with equal team status does not mean that we all play the same position. I think that's a good comment. I think that's, that's a good quote. We have equal access to God. And that text in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28 is speaking of that, that equal right of access to being a child of God, to, to become uh, someone who receives an inheritance, who is an heir according to that promise of Abraham. It says nothing about those roles in worship. The only way to understand God's will on a matter and His will is the one that matters, the only way to truly understand His will is to ask the question, did God speak on it? If He did speak on it, it's a matter of faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. And we might add this in Hebrews 11 and verse 6. The Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please God. And so if God has spoken on a matter and He has spoken on this matter, then we're able to look into His Word, we're able to determine what God has to say on the matter, and once we determine what God has said on the matter, and then we know where we should stand on that matter. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm going to read our text 8 through 14 in the book, but I'm going to add verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15, you may already be there in, in your Bible. I'm reading from the New American Standard. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet, for it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Two simple points that we're going to look at, two simple divisions. The first one will be shorter in this context. Number one, Paul's inspired will for Christian men in the public assembly. That's a long point. Let me read it again. Paul's inspired will for Christian men in the public assembly. That's going to be verse 8. In verses 9 through 15, we're going to have Paul's inspired will for Christian women in the public assembly. And so it's as simple as that. Let's start with that first one, verse 8. Let me read it again for emphasis sake. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. We see the authority here. Therefore, that previous verse that Dan dealt with that section, Paul makes statement that he was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I don't know if that's exactly all that is entailed in the word therefore. You know, we say when you read the word therefore, you ask, what is it therefore? And so Paul in those, those first verses of chapter 2, he speaks of prayer. And then he comes along to verse 8 and he says, It is my will, it is my inspired will that, that the men are to be leading in those prayers. But perhaps it goes back just to verse 7. Paul says, I am appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And so as an apostle, as a preacher, as a teacher, therefore... 
Based upon that authority, based upon that authority, I am extending heaven's will. Do you remember when Jesus spoke to those apostles of His? And He spoke to them in Matthew chapter 16, and He said to them, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That apostolic authority. The sense of that really is, it will, it will have been loosed it already. It will have been bound. When you bind something, it's something that has already been bound in heaven. When you loose something, it is something that has already been loosed in heaven. And so that's Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37, Paul makes it clear, and it's in a context that's going to be similar to this one. He makes it very clear in that context that the commandment, the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Therefore, I, I want. The word want is from the Greek word bolomai, and it's a word that conveys a note of authoritative command. And you see it in the text. Therefore, I want. And then verse 9, likewise, I want. There's a difference in what I want and what Paul wants. Do you understand the difference in that? I may want something, I may desire something, but I'm not an apostle. He was an apostle of Christ. He was truly an ambassador of Christ. He was able to preach on His behalf. The Holy Spirit giving Him these words as He penned these words. He is giving us nothing less. Notice this, and I know I'm speaking partly in that echo chamber or preaching to the choir as we sometimes say. You probably agree with this. But we need to understand that this isn't just Paul's, you know, I'm not married and I don't really like women. I don't think they ought to be, that's what Paul's accused of that very often, being a crusty old bachelor. No, he is, he's giving heaven's will on the matter. Heaven's will on the matter. Therefore, I want men. Earlier in this text, going back to verse 1, uh, the word men is used. First of all, therefore I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. The word men there is anthropos. He's talking about mankind. Verse 4, speaking of God who desires all men to be saved. That's anthropos. Again, mankind. Verse 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Anthropos, again, mankind. We see both male and female. The word is different here. The word is not anthropos, it's andros. And it's the plural form of the word oner. And it's a word that means men, adult human males. We see males in this text. So we see in the in the original language, that he's speaking here differently of the previous three times that we see men in our text. Therefore, I want the men, not the women. I want the men. It's made clear when you look at verse 9. Likewise, I want women. And so it's so clear in the English language, it's clear in the Greek that he's speaking here of men. I want men in every place. That's interesting to me. It's interesting to me, not just in Ephesus, not just in Corinth, not just in Moundsville. I want men in every place. This is something that is universally applicable. When I go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and we are going to talk about that some today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 34, there's this passage, which, brethren, I, I, I hold these as parallel passages. I believe that they are. Now, you may disagree with that. And there is a sense that this is a, an assembly that we won't see exactly today, in that we had tongue speakers and we had prophets. I understand that a miraculous, uh, a miraculous meeting. However, these principles are the same. In verse 34, he said, The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. When you look at verse 33, he says, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. It's my contention that last statement, that last part of verse 33, belongs with verse 34. God is not the God of confusion, but of peace. And then a new thought 
As in all the churches of the saints, the women are to keep silent in the churches. It's, it's a parallel passage. Over here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says, I want, it is heaven's will, I want the men in every place to pray. Now, this doesn't mean that, that women are not permitted to pray, does it? Does that mean that women are not permitted to pray? Well, well, well surely not. In fact, women are are encouraged to pray. Do they not fall within uh, that category in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17 of praying without ceasing? Sure. Women are to pray without ceasing. In 1 Corinthians 11, 5, there's a reference to women praying and, and prophesying. Let me read that. But, in, but every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. And so there you see women who were praying and prophesying. Well, this passage says that it is my will that men do the praying. Well, but we know that women often prayed. Uh, that context was a context that would not be in violation of chapter 14 or of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Perhaps it was a, a meeting of women. Or uh, they were teaching a Bible class with uh, children present. But you have women praying there. He can't be speaking of just prayer. Women, he cannot be speaking here of just prayer. He's speaking of something different. He's talking about the leading of that prayer. The leading of that prayer during the corporate assembly. Now that's a phrase that I'm going to use occasionally as we study today. The corporate assembly. We're talking about a mixed assembly. Such as this. Where we have men and women present in the assembly. It is His will. And notice in our assembly we've had men stand up and lead public prayers. Well, that's what Paul is speaking of here in, in, this, in this text. Now, some feel that this is, is too restrictive. Too restrictive to our, our Christian sisters. Well, there's some restrictions for our Christian brothers too. Notice in the text. These Christian brothers are to lift up holy hands. And we, we just sang a song a moment ago that used that phrase. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Well... The restriction here placed upon the men, they must have holy hands. They must have holy hands. Now, is he speaking here of these hands? Are these hands holy or unholy? I don't think so. I don't think this is, this is Bible authority to, to lift up your hands in worship. I was preaching one time one place and somebody just raised their hand and started holding their hand up in, in the service. Maybe you've had that happen to you. Lift their hand up in the service. And, and probably they've, they've come back to this passage, 1 Timothy chapter 2, and men are to lift up holy hands. Uh, this, is a, this is a metaphor. These hands are, are not holy. It's used in the Old Testament. David used it some. In 2 Samuel 22 and verse 21, uh, David said, The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands He has recompensed me. You think he's talking about clean hands in the sense of, of these? No, he's talking about a life. He's talking about living a, a holy life, a sanctified life. In Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, David said, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? And then he answers his own question, He who has clean hands and a pure heart. We know something about clean hands, don't we, during this um, pandemic, you know, this um, coronavirus pandemic. How many times did you wash your hands or use hand sanitizer? You know, we were just scared to death in the beginning of this thing. And um, I remember I was at Lowe's when this first started and they had plexiglass up. And I took my Lowe's card to go like that. And when I leaned forward, I put my head up against the plexiglass, you know. And um, I'd heard all these things about... And so I went out in the car and I hand sanitized my head, you know. <laughs> that was a... That was quite a sight. Uh, so I hand sanitized, you know, did that. So I've got clean hands and a clean head, you know. Well, is that what he's talking about? No, obviously, obviously he's not. Here, here's, a, here's a restriction for our Christian brothers. Not just for our Christian sisters... When you're leading a prayer, you're leading a public prayer, you need to be a man of a holy life. You need to be someone with, with holy hands. I sometimes look at this. My, my, my son now is about this tall. He, he looks down on me, not up on me. But I remember a time when my children both looked up to me and I would come home from work and they would go like this and raise their hands up and have me, want me to pick them up. 
And so I see a metaphor here, not just the fact of the, the clean hands being a clean life, but, but these men are, are in essence reaching up to the Father. It, this is an, the act of prayer. N- not literally raising their hands, though I don't suppose it would be a violation of someone raising your hands if you're, you're, praising, you're praying to God, if you chose to do that, but that's not what he's speaking of here. Metaphorically, someone with clean hands, he's reaching up to the Father. Uh, he's, he's petitioning the Father. He's asking His Father. That's what we see in, in this text. The second part says, without wrath and dissension, or wrath and disputing. Uh, I think the old King James said wrath and doubting. Well, the word is, the, these words are interesting, and I'm going to give two quotes, one from Roper and one from Wayne Jackson. And Roper said, It is possible that some in the congregation were using public prayers as an opportunity to vent their anger. More likely, Paul had in mind asking brethren who were not troublemakers to lead public prayers. That's a good thought, isn't it? I've heard many sermons preached in a prayer. You know, I've heard the bulletin read in the prayer. I've heard, um, you know, m- many, many scriptures. And, and I know sometimes we quote parts of scripture, and that certainly is appropriate and fine, but, but there is a difference in a sermon and a prayer. There's a difference in those. What about scolding somebody? Quoting Hebrews 10.25 because somebody's there and they maybe won't be there tonight. So let's make sure that we get that in our prayer. God knows about Hebrews 10.25. God knows about these other, these other verses of Scripture. And so when men are publicly, and that's what we see as a public setting here, when men are leading in prayer, that they are men of clean hands and a pure heart. They're men who are, are petitioning the Father. And they're men who aren't using that as a bully pulpit, so to speak, to, to preach and teach. And to, and to spread this troublemaking. Jackson said it this way similarly, Worship leaders must be men of peaceful dispositions and not given to contention. Or to use Paul's words, they must be void of wrath and disputing. The later term possibly indicating angry disagreements, shouting matches, etc. How could a congregation have its highest spiritual attention focused upon worshiping God when the worship leader is known to be a contentious person? It is difficult, if not impossible, to worship when one is angry or when he is frustrated by the contemplation of someone leading the service who has no earthly business doing so. I think that's a good thought. It is a good, we need to be thoughtful. Sometimes all you need is a heartbeat. Um, you, you, just, you need to be able to, and we'll put you in a Bible class because we need a Bible class teacher. We need somebody to head the table. We need somebody to lead that singing. We need somebody to word that prayer. And maybe we'll be in violation of this verse and put someone up front leading our thoughts and minds and they are someone without holy hands. They are someone who, who leans toward wrath and dissension or, or disputing. And so we ought to think about that. The second part of the passage, 9 and following, Paul's inspired will for, for Christian sisters. Now, there are quotes in the book that I'm, I'm certainly not using here today. There's an interesting thought here about the modesty issue and it, it reflecting the fact that this is a public setting. A woman, and I'm not going to become graphic here, but a woman doesn't have to worry about modesty in the home. A woman in the home doesn't necessarily have to dress in a certain way. He isn't referencing the home here. He's, he's referencing a public setting. And so we see this public setting, this assembly. It may be the Lord's Day assembly. It may be a Wednesday evening. It may be a time when men and women come together. And in this setting, the men are to be leading. They're to lead in the prayer. They're to lead in worship. And we're going to see that as we read further. And he says, likewise, I want the women. So two things about the women. The first one is, Paul's first will is the way she adorns herself in the assembly. And secondly, is the way she learns in the assembly. Can we keep those two thoughts before our mind? The way she adorns herself in the assembly, and then the way she learns in the assembly. The first one, the way she adorns herself. Notice again, I want, I want, this is heaven's will on the matter. I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls and costly garments. We read these passages and we almost entirely apply them to a woman covering up, right? Not wearing a a short uh, dress or very tight form-fitting clothes. And, And there is an application, I think, especially in the word discreetly there. 
But when you think of the word modest, when you hear the word modest, you don't know, we may think of that as we're preaching these lessons and things, but when we think of someone being modest, we're thinking of someone not, not bragging, not being boastful of maybe something they have. Or maybe somebody is very talented, and, 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 but, but, but they're very humble. And you say, you're very modest. You're, you're very modest. You, you're, you, you have wonderful abilities and talents, and thank you. Well, no, I, you're a very modest person. Well, that's the way we typically think of the word. Here, he's not talking about necessarily wearing too little clothing. He's talking about extravagance. He's talking about flaunting your, your wealth. And so the attention, I like the way Jackson put it, he said, attention must be given to the arrangement, design, fashion, etc. of her outward appearance in such a way as to complement and convey her spiritual virtues. One's outward attire is an expression of a person's true character. A woman's dress is the mirror of her mind. Now, he went on to say, and it's in, it's in the manuscript if you want to read it in the book, that it, the same is true for men. Now, there are some things that aren't true for both sexes. There are just some things. Women have a power that men do not possess, for example, over their husbands. A man may be won by the conduct of his wife. The opposite may be true, but Peter didn't say that. He didn't say that to be true. There's a certain power that a woman has over her husband that he doesn't possess over her necessarily. Now, it certainly could be true a woman's dress is the mirror of his mind and our dress is the mirror of our mind. Uh, I saw a young man the other day and, and he had on a kind of a tight uh, t-shirt, you know, and I noticed his triceps and stuff. And he's a young man. I said, you've been hitting the weights? And he said, oh, well, yeah, I've been hitting the weights. Well... I saw another young man his age didn't have on such a tight form-fitting shirt. He hadn't been hitting the weight. So what's he doing? He wants to show those muscles off a little bit, right? And so the thought is, I'm working on this and I want to do this and I'm going to show this off. Well, here, here in the text, uh, there was some showing off going on. Uh, Roper again said this, the, the idea of braided hair and such. We may have some ladies in our assembly today with braided hair. I, I don't know if we do. I, I wouldn't be pointing you out. And so, uh, is that what he's speaking of here? He did use the phrase braided hair. Well, Roper said this, and I agree with this, and I, I think it's a great thought. He did not have in mind the simple braids of a schoolgirl, but the elaborate hairdos of Roman society. The hair was piled high and decorated with costly jewels, no expense was spared to make them dazzling. Braids in those days often represented fortunes. They were articles of luxury, not with gold or pearls or costly garments. Probably most Christian women in Ephesus could not afford the extravagance Paul mentioned, but some in the congregation were rich. You know, when you read later in this book, uh, chapter 6 especially, charge those who are rich in this world. You know, not to trust in those uncertain riches. Be, be willing to share, etc. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, uh, etc. Some in the congregation were rich. Paul's words were probably aimed at wealthy Christian women who used the assemblies as an opportunity to display their wealth. It should not be necessi necessary to emphasize that the worship assembly is for God's glorification. I'm still reading Roper, not self-glorification. In Paul's day, the problem was overdressing. In some parts of the world today, the problem is underdressing or wearing clothing so form-fitting it leaves nothing to the imagination. That's true. That, that's certainly true. In our assemblies today, it probably... It probably isn't the problem that our sisters or our brothers, our sisters are dressing in such a way to flaunt their wealth. It may be dressed in such a way to, to flaunt their shape. You know, that they're going to the gym or that they feel that they look attractive. And I want to be careful about this as we're talking about this. We need to preach on this. We need to mention this. Uh, absolutely. It needs to be something that... that we read occasionally and we emphasize occasionally that the worship service is not to glorify the preacher, certainly. We're not trying to glorify our song leaders or any men who are up front. We're not trying to dress in such a way as to draw attention to ourselves. In fact, it's the opposite. We come together to worship and glorify God. We don't want something in that service to draw attention away from God and place that attention on us. I think about what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3. 
Verses 3 and 4, which, which these passages all run hand in hand. All of these passages that we're reading run hand in hand. He says, Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses, it says in the New American Standard. But let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. And so Peter says... Don't let your adorning be merely outward. That isn't to say that a person, a woman, um, could not put makeup on and uh, wear a nice uh, dress uh, or outfit, um, makeup and all of those types of things. In fact, the word adorn here is cosmeto, where we get our word cosmetics from. And so the emphasis, though, seems to be to me for these sisters... Worship is not about you. You need to be careful in the things that you're wearing. Uh, don't draw attention away from God. And so the first part of this inspired will for Christian women in the public assembly is uh, the way she adorns herself. Secondly, verses 11 and 12, the way she learns in the assembly. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Paul says, I do not allow this. I mentioned, and I already read the passage, and I'm just going to, I have a ribbon here in this section anyway in my Bible. I'm going to go to chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians again. I see these passages as parallel. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves. Interesting there. He did, he's not speaking of subjugation. He's speaking of subjection. They are to subject themselves. And so you see some humility here. They are to subject themselves just as the law also says. There are two different words. The word here, uh, at least the, the core word is sagao in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And it does mean silence. It, it means silence. Uh, the word we see over here in 1 Timothy chapter 2 is hesukia. And I'm not a Greek scholar, that's the best way I can pronounce it. Hesukia. And it is a word that means quietness, as is translated there. Now, in 1 Corinthians 14, I know we aren't over there, but I want to mention something about this text uh, quickly as we're, as we're applying the two passages and somewhat comparing them. I understand that 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14, we're talking about spiritual gifts. Chapter 12, we see the enumeration of those gifts. Uh, you know, chapter um, 14, we see some, some regulation of, of those gifts. And you see the regulation of those gifts. And this word silence or silent is used three times. And I know you know this in this, in this assembly today. But verse 28, he says, If there is no interpreter, he, that is a tongue speaker, someone who could speak in a language, he must keep silent in the church. That phrase, in the church, is used for the assembly. The, the assembled church. In the assembly, a tongue speaker, someone who could speak a language that no one could understand, if there were no interpreters present, he was to keep silent. He's not permitted to take the lead in the public service. He's not permitted to take that role of leading in the public service. He goes on in verse, ver, the following verses. Let two or three prophets speak... And let the others pass judgment. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, prophet, the first one must keep silent. And so, I'm up here speaking, for example, let's say I'm a prophet. We're in a first century church where there are miraculous gifts. And a revelation comes to another prophet. According to this, I need to cease being the public speaker and the second one comes up and he speaks so I can no longer lead the service. So there you see twice that the men are to be silent. And then he says in verse 34, the women are to keep silent in the churches, in the public assembly. The women were not permitted to take the lead. How do you know this is a public assembly of the church? Well, verse 23 says, therefore, if the whole church assembles together, and he mentions, and if all speak in tongues, and etc., he mentions the whole church assembling. Verse 25, he says, speaks of worshiping God. Someone comes in to the assembly, he speaks of worshiping God there. Verse 26, when you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation. And so, what we're talking about here in this passage is the assembled church. Now, I understand the... The assembly is different than our assemblies. We don't have tongue speakers. We don't have prophets uh, speaking today. 
But we do have an assembled church. And so when the church assembles together, all things must be done decently and in order as he ends the chapter in verse 40. In this setting, tongue speakers were to be silent. They were not to take the role of public speaker if there were no interpreters. Prophets were to be silent if another prophet had received a revelation. They were no longer to lead the public service and the women under no circumstances were to lead in the public service. They were not permitted to lead in the public service. Now he goes on to say if they desire to learn anything let them ask their own husbands at home. And I know that passage has brought up some, may a woman say amen in an assembly, may a woman ask a Bible question in a Bible class, may she read a scripture in a, in a Bible class. I believe a Bible class setting would be more an Acts 18 issue. In Acts chapter 18 you have Aquila and Priscilla who heard Apollos preach. And Aquila and Priscilla, they heard him and they took him aside. It doesn't say that Priscilla led that Bible study, but the husband and wife and Apollos were speaking of scriptures and they were studying together. And so, can a woman ask a question in a Bible study? Well, when it isn't, it isn't the assembly as, as this is, as, as the church is assembled for worship and she was in submission undoubtedly to be right with what we see in our text, she was in, in submission. Now, back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul said, A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. I do not allow a woman to teach. She is not to take the role of the public speaker or teacher. How do you know that, Ed? Well, because women are generally encouraged to teach. Women are, are to teach. It's something important. Titus chapter 2 verses 3 and 4, Paul instructed older women to teach what is good. Women are obligated to sing in worship. We are teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We've had women teaching here this morning, have we not? Did you ladies in, in, join in in our songs this morning? You were teaching and admonishing. You weren't taking the role of a public speaker. It wasn't teacher-pupil, uh, it was reciprocal. We were teaching one another. We were speaking to one another. We were teaching and admonishing one another. No violation there. No violation in that. Uh, Acts 18.26, as we mentioned, under some circumstances, uh, a woman can even teach a man, um, as long as it's uh, in a non-assembly circumstance. My wife teaches me things. There are many times my wife and I speak of things and she'll say something to me and I'm like, well, I never thought of that. And I won't be able to, I don't remember what she said half the time, but um, I came home from work one day, and she isn't here, is she? Uh, <laughs> I came home from work one day and she had been listening to to something, I forget what it was. She had been studying something, listening to something, and she said, that passage in, in Romans where Paul talks about heaping coals of fire on, on someone's head. Well, that's kind of a difficult passage in our society to understand exactly what Paul was saying. And she said, you know, I heard something today and, and she started to, to teach me. She started to tell me what she had learned. And we're sitting there in the living room and I was like, well, it must not have made a great impression on me as I don't remember it today, but, but, but I'm making this point. My wife was teaching me. Was that a violation of, of what Paul said here? No. Uh, she was in submission to me. She wasn't taking the lead uh, uh, as, a, as a public speaker. I want to also mention um, 1 Corinthians 11.5. I've already brought that up. In 1 Corinthians 11.5, this is the passage that is brought up many times. Acts 18.26 with Priscilla. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 5. These are, these are verses you need to familiarize yourself with. Every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. People will quickly run to this verse and say, we see here in the public assembly of the church that women were praying and prophesying. And they mean by that they were leading the prayers and they were prophesying. When you prophesy, you're teaching, you're edifying, you're building up the church. And so these women at Corinth, as long as they were veiled, as long as they had a veil on, they were permitted to stand up in the public assembly 
and teach and to lead prayers in that public assembly. No, this verse is regulated by chapter 14 and verse 34. You know what we do? We, we take verses like the Galatians 3.28 lens and we pull them out of their context. We'll take a phrase and we'll focus on that phrase. We'll take a verse and we'll focus on that verse. You know this. I'm just reminding you what you already know. These chapters in verse division, they were not there. The, the, the punctuation was not there. We'll take these passages out of their context and we proof text with them. That's one of the worst things about having verse by verse in our Bibles. We'll proof text with them. Well, this verse says that. Now the next verse, it may say something different, but this verse says... Understand as you're reading this letter and you go through chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13, and you get to chapter 14 when he says the women are to be silent in the churches. And so many will say, well, that's a contradiction. Paul's contradicting himself. He couldn't be contradicting himself. And so we'll just erase chapter 14 and verse 34 and we'll just say, well, that was a context where the women were being unruly. Maybe they were. Maybe they were in the context of, of not disrupting the service. They were disrupting the service. That's the only sense in which they were not permitted to take the role. They were disrupting the service. Well, chapter 11 and verse 5 should not be explained away, uh, or, or, or rather uh, should not explain away chapter 14 and verse 34. Chapter 14 and verse 34 regulates chapter 11 and verse 5. Women were permitted to lead in prayer and lead a Bible study provided they weren't in violation of chapter 14 or 1 Timothy chapter 2. What we're studying here today. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 11 and 12. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Now the second part of that um, really helps us to understand why it is that a woman is unable to, to lead in the singing, to, to head the Lord's table. And I would, I would say hand out the Lord's Supper. Now I understand that we've created something here that didn't maybe exist in the first century. We have, we have a table, we have golden trays, and we'll have you know, four men on each side standing up here. They're standing up. Maybe they didn't do it that way in the first century. I don't know how they did it. I have no idea. Someone mentioned, in fact it was at Polishing the Pulpit this year, Matt Vega mentioned that his wife very often hands him the Lord's Supper and those little cups. Sometimes he forgets to get his cup and she'll... she'll She'll hand him the Lord's Supper. Maybe you're sitting in a pew and a woman may hand you the tray as you're going down. But there's a difference in that and in standing up. The standing up has the appearance, at least, of, of leading. And so Paul said, I do not permit a woman to teach. I do not permit a woman to publicly lead in prayer. And I do not permit a woman to exercise authority uh, over, over men in, in the church. And so... Could a reasonable person conclude, this is what Matt Vega said, and I like this, I want to include this. I didn't put this in a manuscript, obviously. I wrote the manuscript before I listened to this lesson. He made an interesting thing. Matt is, Matt is a lawyer and teaches law, and he said this, there's a reasonable person uh, statute. Could a reasonable person conclude this? Could a reasonable person conclude that if your wife hands you one of those little disposable cups, you forgot this, Ed, that she's leading me in worship? A reasonable person wouldn't conclude that. But could a reasonable person conclude if you had four ladies on each side of the Lord's table and they were going about and leading, could a reasonable person conclude that they were leading in worship? I think so. I think they could. So, so don't put yourself in that position. Now, that's not something that, that we, we ought to be doing because they very well uh, may be violation of this, leading in worship. So if they're up front, I would say, l let's not do that. The, the three things, and I want to mention this quickly, there are three indications here of God's desire for male leadership in the assembly. The first one is males, andros. Males are to lead in public prayer. Number two, women are not permitted to teach. We've already seen women are permitted to teach in so many contexts. In so many areas, women are permitted to teach. Other women, children, maybe even sometimes one-on-one -on -one Bible studies and things of that nature. But some sense, and it must be the sense of in the assembled church, they are not permitted to take that lead. And then number three, they're not permitted to exercise authority. And so those three indications we see in the text. The King James Version misses the mark when it uses the word usurp. It misses, it misses the mark here. Uh, 
and, and this is why I say this, this is probably one of the only places that many will, will grab the word usurp or use the translation there in that respect because I've heard people say, well, as long as she does not usurp the authority, if the elders give her the authority to teach, she's not usurping it. Well, someone's usurping it. You know who's usurping it? It would be the elders in that respect. Someone would be usurping authority that doesn't belong to them. When Paul, as an ambassador of Christ, as an apostle of Christ, says, I do not permit this, and then you as an elder say, well, I do permit it, you're usurping authority. You're going further, and you're taking authority that doesn't doesn't belong to you to do that. Uh, Most modern translations use the phrase exercise authority. They're not permitted to exercise authority. Whether they were asked to do it or not, they're exercising that authority. Now why do we see the division of gender roles in worship? Paul very plainly says, verse 13, For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. So he gives two reasons. Number one, Adam was first to be created. Number two, woman was the first to sin. Now, I don't believe this means that women are more gullible than men. I don't believe that. I don't believe that's what he's saying. That women are more gullible than men. She was deceived and he wasn't. If anything... Now notice this. If anything, this is an indictment on Adam's leadership. Think about that for a moment. It's an indictment perhaps on Adam's leadership. The woman was the first to sin. She took the lead. She did take the lead there. She ate that fruit and she took it and gave it to her husband and she sinned in that. And so you can make the argument, well, here a woman took the lead and she led into sin. Well, Adam was not leading properly in that circumstance. He should have been taking the lead. And you can believe about that what you want, but the two reasons God created Adam first, it was his intention to have male spiritual leadership in the home and ultimately in the church today. And number two, the woman fell into the transgression. What about verse 15? This wasn't a sign to me, but I looked and I don't believe anybody gets it. Uh, I believe that maybe it was just inadvertently left off, so I, I, I didn't include it, but, but I mentioned a few things about it. But women will be preserved as New American Standards, saved, King James and others, but the woman will be preserved or saved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. He isn't speaking necessarily here of salvation in this context, is he? He's speaking of roles in in worship. He's speaking of roles in worship. And so Dave Miller said this, Paul concluded his instruction by noting how women may be preserved or saved from falling into the same trap. What trap? The same one that Mother Eve fell into. Women may be preserved from, from what Mother Eve did when she took the lead, took the role, and thereby committed that sin, she may do that. How may she do that? By by childbearing. Does that mean that a woman that is unable to have a child cannot be preserved, cannot be saved, cannot miss this? Well, he says that childbearing is... This is in Piloting the Strait. Childbearing is the figure of speech here in this text known as synecdoche, in which a part stands for the whole. Thus, Paul is referring to the whole of female responsibility. Women may avoid taking to themselves an illicit function, doing something they're not authorized to do, by concentrating on the function assigned to them by God, undertaken with faith, love, and holiness in sobriety. In other words, God has placed men in a certain sphere in the home and in the church, and He has given women their their sphere and their role in the home and in the church. If they focus on that and focus on what God has has placed, has, has given them talents and abilities to do, they're going to be preserved from that. They're not going to fall into that same thing that Mother Eve fell into. I think that's a good thought. I think it's plausible. A plausible explanation. Let me close with with one other quote from Dave Miller. This was 26 years ago. 1996. 26 years ago he says, the tremendous usurpage of feminism in our country is impacting virtually every sphere of American culture. As usual, the church of our Lord is feeling the effects of this scenario. Those who resist these human innovations are considered tradition bound, resistant to change, narrow-minded, etc., as if they cannot hold honest, studied convictions on such matters. I, for one, would be perfectly willing for women to have complete access to leadership roles in the church. Many talented, godly women have abilities and talents that would enable them to surpass many of the male worship leaders functioning today. 
However, the Bible stands as an unalterable, eternal declaration of God's will on the matter. By these words we will be judged, John 12 and verse 48. May we all bow humbly and submissively before the God of heaven. I concur with that. Uh, this isn't a personal vendetta when you, when you study this. Let me make one last observation. I probably went a little long. One last observation. Sometimes when we talk about controversial type topics, we spend half our time apologizing for the topic, telling why, why it is the case that this and this, and we finally get around to quietly, we just want to look at God's will and say, what is heaven's will on the matter? This is heaven's will on the matter of the roles of men and women in worship. Maybe things for all of us to work on. Uh, you know, having those holy hands, uh, living that clean life, um, being men who are not filled with wrath or, or disputing, and as our Christian sisters, dressing in such a way not to gain glorification, but, but to deflect that to God certainly, and understanding that role, that men are to be the spiritual leaders in the church and in the home. Thank you kindly.